Welcome to Experience Focus Leaders. I'm delighted to introduce you to Nathan Beckord. Nathan is the CEO of Founder Suite, which is a solution for startups looking to raise money and funding stack for VCs and iBankers. And we are delighted to have Nathan on to really weigh in into the key challenges in the growth ecosystems, whether it's from startups, VCs, or advisors on how they raise capital and enable growth more efficiently. Welcome to the pod, Nathan. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. So Nathan, tell us a little bit about what are the main challenges in investor communications? And you have a really great insight into both investor communications from to startups or growth companies to VCs, and then VCs themselves raising to limited partners that fund their funds. So you have a pretty holistic view. I think we discussed earlier the essence of simplicity and not overloading people with too much information to begin with, but let's dive into more details because I can't think of a person with more clear view into that than yourself. Yeah, on the startup side, startups approaching investors, communication has to be almost painfully simplified and short. (laughs) One of the Mm -hmm. top bits of advice I give founders all the time is, you know, make your intro email, your intro request email as short as humanly possible. A mistake I see is founders will put their entire history in the intro email, right? five paragraphs of dense text and they attach a 45 megabyte PowerPoint and they're wondering why they're not having much luck on their fundraising because no one actually looked at your stuff. They saw that email, nope, and they they move it beyond. So, And, and I think the context support. is yeah. just to like d- dive into that because this is, we, we can treat VCs in this case as any busy uh, decision maker, whether it's an executive that gets pitched a lot of ideas or VCs gets pitched a lot of deals, they're overwhelmed with typically kind of these types of introductions. And we distinguish between VCs and, for example, maybe angels that don't have the same uh, volume. And they're they're scanning this on their phone in, yeah. in the well in the toilet or whatever on the move on the run in between like in between meetings. And that is the context for where a lot of this could be received. Is that accurate? one of the challenges in getting through to these busy people? Absolutely. That is, that's a good summary. They are getting hundreds of these intros a day from people they know, and they're getting a lot of cold email too, right? So it's both. That's all coming into their inbox, into their phone. And they are, they're spending a few seconds really skimming these emails, looking for something that catches their eye. Oh, this guy was early meta employee now doing something in AI, whatever. They're Mm -hmm. looking for little diamonds that are jumping out. And then they might click through to the deck and see Mm -hmm. what this person's all about. But they're not taking the time to thoroughly read and contemplate your long email. And they might not even go through and click through to the the deck unless it really catches their eye in the email. So that's, again, to summarize, picture they're getting hundreds of, even a couple hundred startup intros a day coming at them. They're just processing each one in a matter of seconds. That's why short is better, right? You can get into the more detail as your relationship with the investor progresses. And you will, right? Once you get, hopefully your intro email leads them to at least look at your deck. I always tell founders have a little teaser deck often a link, like we have a pitch deck hosting tool in Founder Suite, and you can put it up online so they can just click that, see it, a couple slides, five slides or so, talking about what you're doing, problem solution, market traction team. And that's interesting enough that they say, thank you for contacting me, CCing my assistant to set up an intro chat. That intro chat, maybe it's 30 minutes, maybe it's a little longer. They like what you're doing. They like, they get a vibe from you. They want to have you come into a maybe an hour long meeting and that and progressively the information flow gets deeper and deeper. The time and attention spent gets longer and longer as you progress. But that first part has to be 
minuscule, microscopic. <laughs> and, another, and, and Nathan, yeah. to play, play with this idea. So what we see is that in normal human interactions, right? The Imagine you're going out on a date and somebody mm -hmm. asks, tell me about yourself, right? And you go and let me, like, where do I begin? I was born and I dated, I divorced this person and I have two kids. You just go in and go into all of your stuff. And this is too much of a kind of overload of information versus a conversation where you kind of normally, you would stop yourself, right? Like, like at least by after one minute, normal people would stop yourself in, in their little monologue and go back in the conversational mode. And so what we see, whether it's with investors or in general, like the best, the best storytellers create what you're just like they're describing, they pique a little bit of interest, right? And, and so, oh, okay, this is interesting. I want to learn more. So one way to peak interest is go book a meeting, right? With the assistant. And I think that's a, a big time goal. But another one is to say, hey, here's a teaser, but provide a way to double click on the area of big interest. And ideally not the type of area that makes it no more relevant to have a meeting, but picks even more curiosity. Because I almost think of the best date is like where you... You can, oh, you learn a little bit about one person in one's environment, then you go have a coffee, and then you go for a walk, and you have different context of how you get to know someone. That's how we're thinking about kind of business communications, where it's more relevant to what people are interested in, what piqued their interest in the uh, initial approach. How are you seeing this play out? Was your tool, and in general was over a long time conversations, right? That you have a deck, but then it needs to be seen by multiple people that may have different interests within the VC partnerships, right? Some may care about the case studies, others may care about financials and they all drill into different areas. So how do you balance this different peaks of interest for different people with simplicity? It goes back to what I was saying. Like it's a progressive kind of peeling yeah. the onion, providing more information as the relationship builds. I think that's the summary. And that's how it goes, right? You're As you build that relationship with the investor, as you get further down the process, more and more information is supplied and digested. And how do you account that? So th that's a kind of, we agree uh, on this, but how do you account that some deals happen much faster, right? And they go... Hey, this is at least in, in the heydays a few years ago, right? People would go really fast. Is it just pure fear of missing out on behalf of investors? Or is there more that can help build confidence and help progress that relationship? Because as a founder or as a seller, what well, you don't have infinite time either, right? Like you don't want to go like yeah. build gazillion relationships. Some of them are may pan out, some of them are not. So Yes, investors have some power in terms of the, the, there may be fewer of them, but, but they're also capitalist commodity. And so how do you protect entrepreneurs' time in this process? Was your tool or in general, what are you seeing the most successful entrepreneurs doing building these relationships at scale? It's going to take a lot of time. It's hard to protect your time because you're asking for others' time. So how do you protect your time? Sure, it's important to protect your time. As a founder, you're reaching out to a couple hundred investors in many cases when you're raising capital, asking for their time. You have to be a bit of a pretty flexible on that. No, it's going to suck up a lot of your time. I always tell founders, the more time you spend researching, doing the due diligence, qualifying investors before even reaching out, before even asking your friend or your business school classmate for an introduction the more time you will save. You don't want to be reaching out to people who are not qualified. I use the word term qualification in a sales context. You want to make sure they actually are investing in your stage, your sector, your geographic your fo focus, that they have some money to, to invest, that they have a new fund they've raised. If you do that, then it will save your time down the line and you're not spending all this time wasting uh, your time seeking investors that aren't a fit. The other kind of element to that, your question was fairly long, but 
how do you make it go faster? How do you get yeah. these deals that happen fast? Part of it is doing that work, right? You want to be, if you're a healthcare AI startup, you want to be talking to investors that are seeking an AI healthcare startup, right? And that's how deals can go fast because this investor has a thesis that AI is going to reshape how telemedicine is done. I'm just making things up, but they have a thesis of how the future might unfold. They're looking for startups that kind of fit that thesis. And when they find a startup that does something like that, and they like the team, they like the background of the founders, it can go really fast, right? So it's a matchmaking process. Like the dating metaphor you said, it's finding people in the right age bracket and marriage right. Yeah, stuff yeah. like that, all those yeah. criteria, right? Yeah, it's not that different than from enterprise sales, where ideally you want to identify people who believe that this is an opportunity or a problem, right? And, and versus spend all your time educating somebody that doesn't know what healthcare or doesn't know what AI is and invest in private mm-hmm. equity type manufacturing deals is just completely new to this and just has the only common thread is that they're capital allocator. So it's pretty obvious, but do that work to accelerate the, the 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 feedback cycles and the getting to know. And you don't need to educate people as much about the opportunity, it sounds like. So if we, let's yeah, just say right. you've succeeded and you have that meeting with a VC, and now you're getting some feedback. And this is where, whether it's VCs or you know customers, a lot of people building new things are torn between different types of feedback. Right. And I think I actually will quote one of your other interviews where you said investors are typically very smart people. 40% of all VCs went to Stanford or Harvard and they're highly opinionated group. And you say, if you ask a question of 10 VCs, you'll get 12 different pieces exactly. of advice. Yep. So <laughs> conflicting, I think conflicting, conflicting, conflicting right? Right? And they're conflicting. Yes. And sometimes even the same person will say two different things. It could be that. And it could be this. And it's and they all maybe mean maybe they just want to appear smart because they went to Harvard or Stanford. I can say that as a Stanford alum. I don't I think it's overrated that it's a sign of intelligence, but there is a there is something people are able to communicate some ideas incredibly fast. And then they do have the benefit of pattern matching. And so if you're wearing the shoes of a founder and you have Hey, this, your feedback on your deck or feedback on your business model or feedback on this, how do you see the most successful founders, uh, be agile and leverage those conversations, but also not be overwhelmed by that feedback? It's tough. It is tough because these people are smart and their opinions, like you said, are strongly, are often given strongly. (laughs) I think the, and so it's hard not to get kind of investor advice whiplash sometimes right because sometimes it is conflicting or it makes you just jump all over the place i think finding patterns right when you've had seven pitch meetings with investors and six of them are confused by your go-to-market strategy they're asking questions in the meeting that make it clear they don't really understand your go-to-market strategy or they don't like it or they're confused they're confused by it they don't like it they you can just tell that's a pattern. That's a pattern that probably means you need to listen to the feedback about your go-to-market strategy and work on that and improve that. Now, others will just have, you know, wild advice on what you should build as a product or they should go after different markets. Stuff like that, I tend to say, okay, thanks. I'll put that in my little product ideas note and file it away, but not pivot my startup based on that. I think that's the danger is founders pivot their startup based on every bit of feedback. Oh, this investor said if I went after uh, the gerontology market instead of the youth market, he might be interested. Maybe I should go after geront and pivot my whole business. That's pretty dangerous. You can you can really damage your startup doing that. And frankly, I, I, just to so look for patterns, take it all with a grain of salt, take it in, meditate on it a little bit, but don't necessarily always act on it. And then frankly, I've learned this a bit the hard way. I listen to my customers and users 10x more, or I wait 
the opinions of my customers and users 10x more than what a VC says. Yes, they are very smart and they have the pattern recognition. They're seeing a lot of things out there in the market, but it's really my customer mm -hmm. that I listen to, not as much the VCs. Simple yeah, and I, th I think and it's interesting. I think you you have a chance to have VCs as customers, right? So that's sort of a unique approach. So tell me a yeah, little bit. Yeah, we're unique in that, that we do have yeah, customers yeah. that are also VCs. So that's a bit. And they're interested in potentially having the founders that they backed, right, be able to raise more capital. So they're, both of your products have relevance to them. So we see, we, we, can, we also have some investors as customers and the ones that actually use the product we, and pay for it, they're like, oh, <laughs> yes, I'm paying attention to what you have to say. Yeah. But also within the reason, they may not be the core market that we're going after. So we need to be still aware of that. But how do you see the investors as a customer type? And are they behaving very differently when it's their needs as a customer are being met versus a general advice to startups? So uh, hopefully this won't be confusing. I'll try and make this little story as clean as possible. Back when we were raising capital a long time ago, we had some advice from a VC. We were selling our product, Founder Suite, to startups. So we we're selling mm -hmm. to startups raising capital. And we had a VC give us some advice like, yeah, that's interesting, but you should build a backend platform that the VCs could use as well to manage their portfolio companies. Like, hmm, maybe that is interesting. We spent six months and X thousands of dollars doing that and then tried to put that out there to investors. And we learned that all these investors manage their portfolio companies in 10 different or a hundred different ways. Right. And some mm -hmm. of them have built their own internal systems. Some of them are using spreadsheets. Like we couldn't sell a product to save our lives. It just didn't work. So product advice from that VC about what we should build was bad advice. It led us down a dead end path and we mm -hmm. threw all that code away and wasted time and money on that, which is dangerous as a startup because you're pretty limited in time and money. Now, okay, that was a couple of years ago. More recently, it, you know, so that was an idea from a VC that we pursued down a dead end path. More recently on Founder Suite, we started to get some VCs using it. Oftentimes they would be pulled in by their startup founders who were raising capital. They would invite their VCs into the account. The VCs would be using it. And then the VCs were contacting like, hey, I've been using this with Acme, one of my companies, but I have seven other companies that are raising capital. How do I work with those companies? And we're like, well, we haven't thought of that, but we had enough of those VCs identifying a use case they wanted to do that they wanted to do. And we built a product which ended up becoming funding stack. And we've since launched that. And we now have several hundred VCs using it. So we were pulled into that market by actual kind of customer need and demand versus an idea from a VC. Right. If that makes sense. Right. And then this yeah, so, well. so ideas are cheap. What you're saying is ideas are cheap, uh, customer behavior and actual usage and what they do as your product is the real kind of driver. And so if the VCs become users or referrers or kind of some part of your go-to market, that's a way more valuable signal. They were making, they were using our original product Founder Suite in a way we hadn't even designed it for. And it wasn't yeah. perfect for that. It wasn't really built for that, but they were still using it and finding enough value even with its imperfections that were like, all right, if they're willing to do that with an imperfect product, let's actually build a real version for them. And it's been pretty good in terms of adoption. Yeah. Let your Got customers, it. whether they're startups or VCs, pull you into that market. Well, so I think what's interesting, you mentioned the power of product development. And so whether it's for VCs or in general, like one of the challenges I think that we see is how do you, quickly roll out new products and then also communicate so that your existing customers actually use the new features, your future customers know about them. We, we see a lot of organizations struggle with that, even relatively small organizations. So both on the velocity of rollout and then communication. Do you see that this is 
a, a um, pervasive challenge? Is it becoming faster with like SaaS companies or other types of companies that are a little bit more be more equipped to to have faster release cycles? You've had a pattern match on this over time, and then how important is that velocity in the, the kind of in the investment process from what you've seen? I wouldn't say we're the masters of this. We could probably do better. Our our approach, our process is pretty simple. Like again, we're still I consider us a startup, even though we've been around several years. We're still fairly small, about thirty one people, and we're resource constrained. We can't build everything people want or ask for or every idea that comes in our brain. I always wonder what Founder Suite or Funding Sec would look like if we had raised a hundred million dollars. We probably would have gone on all these other paths and dead ends and great building crazy stuff. And it'd probably be a very bloated product, right? Part of the beauty of being resource constrained is you can only build a few things at a time. And so it goes back to the same thing I've, I've said, but we're looking for patterns from our users. Oh, look, repeatedly customers are asking, here's one very simple example. We have a pitch deck hosting tool. You can upload your pitch deck. You can send it out through the system. You can see who opens your email, who opens the pitch deck, how much time they spend on the pitch deck. Over and over again, we're getting customers saying, I want to track the per slide views, right? Which is something Docsend and and some others have. It's a pattern, right? The, the market expects that in the functionality. So we're going to build that. That's just one simple example. Sometimes that's like keeping up with competitors, but other times it's something a little bit more innovative where customers are like, oh, it'd be so cool if I could do X, Y, Z. When we start to see that pattern, then we figure out how much time it will take to build it, what kind of business impact it will have, whether it could actually leap us forward a little bit. Here's an example of leaping forward. We're about to launch a chat GPT integration to our email tool, right? No one else really has this, whereas the docs end viewing the time per slide is keeping up with the market, making sure we're you know, competitive with the market. This is actually fairly innovative, I think, but it'll help you write emails to investors and others, things like that. And we're getting people signaling around that. Now, how do we communicate this stuff when we launch? Here's why I'd say we're not the best at it. We usually put it in an email newsletter <laughs> yeah. and say, hey, new product. And that's about it. Sometimes we'll have a banner or I'll, I'll show it on our onboarding webinars. We do periodic webinars for new users. So I'll show new features on that or our funding hacks talk. I'll, I'll put it, weave it into that discussion. I'd probably do a, a better job of communicating new stuff. So if you got uh, ideas on that, I'd love to hear. Yeah. Look, I, I think it's an interesting challenge. I think one of the things that we found is that product marketers are at least in, in my other hat are some of our kind of early adapters because they that's the challenge that they deal with. They have to launch new products. They have typically the more complex the organization, the more stakeholders they need to have in there. And then creating relevant use cases where people could identify, oh, okay, I have this problem. And then all those features come in play. But just saying, hey, yeah. I have a feature doesn't really work on its own, right? Because it, you need to connect that feature to, to, to a real problem. And not everybody has that problem you know, all at once. Most, you know, If you're lucky, you get a lot of those features that everybody could benefit from, but majority of the enterprise innovation is, is limited. So I think being able to read, re, you know, something that we see our customers do like Salesforce, they organize them in themes, and then the themes are relevant enough. And so people review, okay, I'm on this theme. Let me review the latest and greatest bundle of features. And I think that's sort of what we see you know, folks do. But I, yeah. I, I think back to back to kind of secrets of what you do communicate. You've been running a podcast on how people raise it, how, how raised it. And so I'm really curious, what have you found as some of the unexpected patterns from having done so many interviews with other founders. Yeah, we started our podcast and it's called How I Raised It a couple of years ago as an experiment, just a fun thing. And it's turned into something really great. I just love it. I, I used to think I knew everything about raising capital 
And I did know a lot because I used to work in investment banking and I've been doing it for a while and I've raised money for Founders Week. I thought I knew everything, right? But then you start to interview other people about how they raise capital. And I learned so much, especially that first year of the podcast. I probably learned more in that first year than in five, 10 years of raising capital. All right. Um, so that's one advantage, right? You learn a lot from smart people. It's such a beautiful way to do that. It's also been really good for marketing. Like we'll turn them into obviously podcasts. We'll turn them into some blog posts and other content forms, video snippets, stuff like that. But we, to answer your question, it, it's almost contrary. We, we learned that there are hundreds of different ways to raise capital. Like we've had 275 episodes and there's 275 different ways to raise capital, but there's also quite a few patterns in those, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of it, some of the stuff we already talked about, qualifying your investors, finding the right investors. One quote I learned on a podcast, which I just almost want to get a tattoo of, it was like, fundraising is not about educating and convincing people. It's about finding believers, basically finding mm -hmm. people who already are seeking what you're doing. They're already believing in your market and just finding those people. So it's not convincing you. I have a good startup. It's just going through the numbers to find the runs that already believe. There's things like that, that we've gleaned from it. That I think you're interesting. Also, it's just a, a relationship game. We talk about, and I talk about fundraising as a sales process all the time. That's a big core mm -hmm. of our webinar, how you've got to talk to a lot of investors. You've got to run it like a sales process where you're trying to move them along through your process. Yet at the same time, it's not totally transactional. It's very much relationship-based. You've got to put in the, the cycles to get to know these investors, to build trust with them. Even I was just at a, a event this past weekend in Texas called the Texas Venture Alliance Gala. Mm -hmm. And it was just like it sounds, right? A gala for Texas-focused investors. And, you know, that was the thing, like just going to the cocktail party before the dinner or meeting after a panel and going out to the lobby and chatting. It's just building those relationship touch points with investors that ultimately lead to deals, right? So that's right. another common theme. I mean, I could go on and on, but those are a couple of things. Any, anything that really surprised you that kind of you, you like a pattern that surprised you that that's jumped out that you were like, because you I mean, there's some... Bible materials and the art of fundraising. It's been around, yeah. but, but I think sometimes the best fundraisers do something different and they interrupt the investors, they interrupt the flow to get disproportionate outcomes. Have you seen some patterns around that? We've had a few people who have been able to break the mold and raise capital like extremely fast. And it's been interesting. I don't know if this is exactly what you're seeking here, but oftentimes they will just, I know one lady who was in the biotech space who hired a COO to take over all her jobs. So all she could do from 6 a.m. when she gets her first cup of coffee till midnight is focus on fundraising and just hustle like you've never hustled before. And I think if you're able to put in time like that, you can get the momentum going, which makes these rounds go faster. So that's been something, a bit of breaking the mold. Instead of having a three-month, four-month fundraise where you're methodically having meetings, they've compressed it all. That was interesting. Yeah. And and so back, so, so that's fantastic examples. And back to your view on the relationship building, right, that you brought up, that it's a relationship business. Um, a lot of people are not fundraising, right? But they this is a perfect time, hopefully, to build a relationship. But as an investor, you don't have time to build a relationship with everyone who's not fundraising, right? You've got a fund to deploy. You can only do that much relationship building. So there's this tension, yeah. I think, for the there. So how do you see how do you see you know, have you seen startups Alec, get the more of the attention or the bandwidth from investors to invest in those relationship steps is it like the updates that go out is it some more personalized touch points like not everybody can go grab a coffee because a lot of the locational 
advantages are like more towards Zoom. So what's been your take on what patterns of success in this relationship building pre-investing? It's, you touched on both of them already. Even when you're not fundraising, you're traveling to Austin or whatever, right? For a weekend. I live in Bay Area, but it was an office for a weekend. Pinging a bunch of people like there. Maybe you've had some touch point. Hey, I'm going to be in town. If you have a few minutes, if you're going to be at this gala, let's catch up over a beer real quick. It's, it's that sort of thing, like using your off time, downtime to nurture those. And, you know, a lot of times people say, hey, I'm not in town or I'm too busy or whatever, but you've still made an effort to reach out and connect with people. But then it's what you also said, it's doing the updates. I'm a huge believer. And of course we have a, a product for this called Investor Updates, but of just doing a simple, pretty short little one pager on a pretty regular basis, monthly, if you can, every other month, if not, but just a short update of what's going on in your business and the good stuff that's happening. This is my favorite part, right? The good stuff that's happening, the progress you're making, new products, new team members, press, whatever it may be, metrics, growth, new customers, whatever it is, right? Just sending out a regular update. And yeah, maybe only half the people on your investor list or your distribution list actually read it and up and look at it. But you can track that in the analytics and you can see who's doing it. If you get into that habit, and that really doesn't take more than 20 minutes a month to do, mm. if you once you get into the pattern, great way to try to nurture those relationships. Fantastic. But Nathan, this has been so helpful. And it sounds like for a lot of the problems, you already have some that startups and investors may be facing, you already have some tools. So how can people find you and leverage leverage those tools that you've already built to address those needs? Sure, of course. Here's the, the plug time, right? Foundersuite.com is our platform for startups. We do have a free plan and, and the paid plans are pretty affordable, $69.99 a month. And then if you're an investor of EC raising capital, we have fundingstack.com, a little bit more of our enterprise version a database that has more LP investors, ways to manage multiple deals at once, and some other features and things like foundersuite.com, fundingstack.com. And then pretty active on LinkedIn, Nathan Beckard on LinkedIn. Uh, maybe mention you saw me on Alex's show. I'm happy to connect with you. But we publish pretty good content all around fundraising and a lot of stuff we've already talked about today on that a couple of times a week. And it, some of it's pretty viral stuff. So it seems to be working and seems to be pretty good. Amazing. Nathan, thanks so much for joining us and sharing your expertise and all of you looking to fund your startup or investors out there. Please take advantage of these tools. We believe in digitizing the fundraising process, the sales process, the marketing process. And Nathan is part of the tribe that believes in that and is helping with that. So Really excited to have you on and share your expertise, Nathan. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. It was fun.